Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming for the talk. Uh, my name is Ujwal Gandhi, and I want to talk to you about QGIS expressions. QGIS expressions is one of my favorite parts about QGIS, and almost every QGIS user would have encountered expression at some point. But I really want to do a deep dive and show you some of the things that you may not have discovered yet, and maybe some of the things that you may not even think it's possible. So let's dive right in. Uh, I run a company called Spatial Thoughts. It's an online academy where we teach a lot of live online cohort-based classes. Uh, we also publish a lot of open source and uh, openly licensed course materials uh, that is globally accessible. Uh, we also are a QGIS certified training provider, so we issue official QGIS certificate and also are a sustaining member of uh, the QGIS project. The goal for today, I want to first start with the basics of the expression engine. What are expressions? What can they do? What's the syntax? And then we'll dive into three specific case studies uh, that'll show you how to build using expressions. Uh, the, if you just take a picture of this, you'll have access to the deck. Uh, we have a lot of links. Everything I'm showing you is documented step by step. So if you want to replicate this, you can get the deck and you have those links available to you. So what is an expression? Well, an expression is a piece of code that can contain some functions, some operators, and it gets evaluated, and you get a value. That's the result of it. In the context of QGIS, uh, your expressions can refer to a layer, or features of a layer. It can have access to the attribute values, geometries. It has got a, uh, you can use the functions that are provided by the QGIS expression engine, and it gets evaluated by the QGIS expression engine, which results in a value, typically once for every feature, and you get the output. People wonder, what's the, the language of the QGIS expression? Well, it's, it's its own language. It is kind of based on SQL, but I think the closest thing I can think of it is, is most like a formula in a spreadsheet. If you ever written a formula in a spreadsheet, it feels very much like that. And every part of QGIS uses expression, whether for symbology or for processing tools or for adding new fields, every part of QGIS uses this. So it's really useful to learn and see how you can build using that. Uh, when you write an expression, there are some rules you need to follow. If you write an expression where you put something in a single quote, that is just a text value. So a single quote of name will just be name. So that's a, if you want to have a text in an expression, that's the single quotes. If you put double quotes around something, QGIS will interpret that as the value of the field called name in your layer. So if you want to refer to a field, you would put in double quotes. If you just want a text, the single quotes. Many programming languages have those both are equivalent. In QGIS, it's not. So it's something to be watching out for. If you start anything with an at symbol, that is a variable that is uh, typically referred to the current features, geometry, current uh, feature, or you can have variables which can change values. And if you put an at, that's interpreted as a variable. And then you have functions, which you call using this parenthesis symbol, where you can uh, put parenthesis, there'll be a function that's part of the QGIS expression engine. Long-time QGIS users will also remember that there are some functions with the dollar symbol. Those have been recently deprecated, and there are equivalents which uses the at syntax. But the old ones will still be there for backwards compatibility, but the newer syntax is at geometry, at ID, and so on. Let's break down expression. We have an expression here, length of at geometry greater than 100. Here we have the function called length, because we are using the parenthesis. At geometry refers to the geometry of the feature, which the expression is being evaluated for. And then we say, check, it's greater than, less than, so there's an operator, and it's a value. So when you have this expression, the QGIS expression engine evaluates this and says, oh, the output of this expression is either true or false, and that's your output. The key thing about expression, and what it really gives the power, is that you can have expressions within expressions within expressions. You can layer them and build using them. Let's see this example. Let's say you have a line, and you want to calculate the azimuth of the line. So we have a function called start point. This is the function which say, given a line geometry, I'll tell you the start, start point of that. There's another function called end point, and we get, say, the same line, we, would, we need the end point. Now, this azimuth is another function. This says, give me two points, I'll give you an azimuth out of that. So we can take this output of these two functions, send it to the azimuth function, and it uses those values and says, this is the azimuth. The documentation for this function says, I'll give you output in radians. What if you want output in degrees? Well, you can just take the whole thing and say, whatever output you get, you convert it to degrees. And you get output in degrees. And this is what really gives you the power where you can kind of layer expressions and build something more complex. 
So we'll see some examples of that. I want to show you how you can do something more complex, but we'll do step by step. We'll build and see what you can do. The first example I want to show is to create an animated cartogram like this. Cartogram is kind of a map visualization where you distort the shape of a uh, feature to represent some variable. I personally hate cartograms because they often are very hard to interpret. They're all distorted. But there's a version of cartogram called uh, non-contiguous area cartogram, which is much better, where it just reduces the size of the polygon uh, in proportion to a variable that you want to map. So here it's a population cartogram where you can see the map of the US states are now scaled so that all of them have equal population density. And all the empty areas are very informative. You can see where there's less population density and all the East Coast has high population density. And also when you have this map, you want to show that this was the original size and then we slowly progressed it to the target size. So an animation really helps. This whole thing is done with one expression. So we'll do this step by step and learn how we can set this up. We start with some data, a polygon layer, we have an attribute called pop estimate 2023. This is the population. So first step, we want to compute the density. That's a variable. Whatever variable you want to map, you want to create that as a column. So we write an expression, pop estimate 2023, divided by area of add geometry. This gives us the, the value of the density for each feature. And we have the density now. We want to scale each feature to the relative density it has compared to the highest density you have in a feature. So we want to say, let's take New Jersey, that's the highest population density. We want to scale each feature so that the density is proportionately uh, towards this feature. So we can have this expression, which says the density in double quotes, which is the current feature's density, divided by the maximum of that column. And that gives us the relative uh, density. We want to now take this relative density and scale the feature proportionately. If you want to scale it, we want to remember that if you have a polygon with area one, let's say we have this square of each side being one, and I want to scale it so that it represents an area 50%. So we want to scale it by 0.5. If I want to create another polygon, which is 50% area, I can't just scale each size x and y by 0.5, because that'll be much smaller polygon. If I want the area to be half, I want to scale it by square root of five, and that is like 0.7. So we want to compute our scaling factor to reduce this. We want to take the whatever proportionate value we have and compute the square root of that. So we take our expression and say the scale factor that we want to use is the square root of the proportional density. And if you do this, we now get a scale factor where the highest density feature is one. It remains the same. Every other feature will be scaled down so that its density is equal to that of the feature that we have. How do we scale the features? Well, QGIS has this expression engine as a function called scale. Given a geometry and a scale factor for both x and y, and an anchor point will just reduce the size. So in our case, we'll say, take the geometry, we just computed the scale factor, we use that, and for now, let's just use centroid as anchor point. So from the centroid, it's just gonna reduce the size to the scale factor. Where do we put this expression? QGIS has this really amazing uh, feature where you have a symbol layer type called geometry generator. I want to take my original data and create a new version of this where the polygons are scaled. I could create a new layer, save it to my disk, but then it's a static layer. If I want to change something, it's not dynamic. Instead, I'll say I'll keep my original data, but I will give you an expression so you create a new geometry and you render that geometry. Don't change my data. Just dynamically compute the new geometry and render that. So if I put my expression, then we just put it here. We get our cartogram, where each feature is scaled according to the, the proportional density that we computed. Pretty cool, we can change the expression and stuff changes. That's what makes it dynamic, but it's not perfect yet. We have some problems. First, if you have polygons of irregular shape, sometimes the centroid will fall out of the polygon. It's not representative. What do we do? Well, this brings us to one of my favorite functions. There's a function called pole of inaccessibility. This is a function that computes a point which is furthest away from the edges. And it's usually used as an anchor point for like a label or for such uh, things. And in our expression now, we can replace the centroid with this pole of inaccessibility. And now take this and we replace it, we get much better anchor point. And this has saved me so many times where I want to put a label at an anchor point and I don't want it to be outside in the centroid. You can use this function instead. 
Secondly, there's a problem. What if we have multi-polygon features? This is Hawaii. Hawaii is made up of eight islands. All of them are a single feature. So I have eight polygons, and I'm scaling it at the same anchor point. This is not good. I want to scale each feature at the anchor point of that island. So how do we do this? Well, this brings us to my another favorite function in the expression engine called array for each. This is your for loop in the expression engine. Where you say, given some set of values, let's say I have one, two, three, four, five, and I want to add one to each item. So I can write an expression, say, for each item in the array, do element plus one. And now this will give us two, three, four, five, six. And that is, you are now done in a for loop within the expression engine. So here we can say we have an island with, we have a feature with eight islands. Give me values from one to eight. And for each of those uh, features, do the scaling with its own centroid. So we can now have an expression like this, which says for each array, for each geometry, use your scale factor. And if you do this, you can see it from this, you get this. Looks much nicer, and it works quite well. And now we have a nice cartogram, but we want to animate it. We want to say we, QGIS has a built-in temporal controller where you can represent time. What we want to do is at the beginning of time, whatever time period you choose, at the beginning we want the full size, the original polygon. And as we move the slider, it goes to, it reduces the size, where at the end, it gives us the true target size. So in case of Alaska, very low population density, this is what the polygon looks like. But we want to show the progression from the original size towards the small one. How do we do this? Whenever you're faced with this problem where you want to do something progressively, uh, this function is really helpful. It's a function called scale linear, where it says, I have some values. They go from 0 to 1,000. In that range, I have a value called 500. But I want to make this value from 0 to 1. What would be the value of 500 if its original range is 0 to 1,000, but now I want the range to be 0 to 1? And it says now I'll scale it down to 0.5. It'll give you the relative scale of that. We can now take this and say, I have my animation. There's variables that says this is the start of the animation, this is the end of the animation. There's another variable which says, what's the current time? Where you are in the timeline. If you're halfway through, this will have the midpoint of the animation. What we want to do is we say, at the start time, make it the one original scale factor. At the end, make it whatever the target scale factor is. And compute the relative scale factor as the animation progresses. So now we can have this function which says, whatever the current map time is, scale from the start to end between one to the scale factor. So start at one at the start time, end up with the scale factor at the end time. And use the current timestamp as the reference. If you do this, we have this nice animation where each feature is now progressively scaled to its target size. And once we apply this expression on our cartogram, we get this nice visualization where we have fixed all the problems and we created this really nice cartogram which shows the relative population density. So this is pretty interesting. I want to show you some more expressions that deal with uh, visualization. We can also ch change the colors and map colors using expressions. So that's the next step that I want to show you. Here we're going to take some contour data and create 3D visualization out of this, just using expressions. We'll first take the contour lines, apply an offset. We're just going to apply an offset. So we'll Say, if the height is x, move it up by x, and then we'll apply a color ramp using expression. This workflow comes from our collaboration with Stephen Kim. He is uh, amazing. If you don't follow him, do follow him. He has some amazing case, use cases of expression that he publishes, and this workflow comes from him. We start with some data, regular contour lines. You can try this with any contour lines you have. We have a field uh, which has the elevation of each line. What we want to do is we want to offset these lines and for that, we can use this function called translate. So it's given a geometry, I'll offset it by x or y. So you can change the geometry. This is useful regardless. If you see a small shift in the data, just apply this expression, and it'll just shift. Uh, here, what we want to do is we want to shift our data and say, whatever data is there, don't shift it in the x direction, but in y direction, shift it proportional to the elevation. If the elevation is more, make it more higher. Uh, if it's low, make it less offset. How do we compute a proportional offset to elevation? 
well, we have our favorite function, scale linear. So we say go from the minimum elevation to the maximum elevation. Whatever the current contour line's elevation is there, compute the relative value from 0 to 0 0.2 degrees. This data set is degrees. So if it's minimum elevation, it will be 0 offset. If it's the highest elevation, it will be 0.2 degree offset, and it will be relative offset in between. So we apply that on the translate, say translate geometry in the y direction using this expression. And now we open our geometry generator and say we have the contours. Instead of just doing add geometry, which is the original geometry, change it to this expression. And now we have this really nice looking 3D visualization that we are not creating a new layer. It's the same layer, but we are just visualizing it in a really interesting 3D way. We can also change the colors. Right now you can see everything is a single color. We can also change the color. You have expressions that control the colors of each feature. Uh, there's a function called ramp color. Given a named color ramp, you can give a value between 0 and 1, and it'll give you the color from that ramp. So if I have a red, yellow, green color ramp, I say give me the zeroth position. That'll be the first value. If I say red, yellow, green, 0.5, it'll give me the midpoint color of that particular color ramp, and 1 will give me the last color. And any value in between, it'll just give you the, the color at that range. So now we can say uh, whatever color uh, we have, so this is the color ramp that goes from like blue to green. We say minimum will be blue, maximum will be green, and compute the relative color based on the elevation. So the lowest elevation will be uh, blue, highest will be green, and we compute the intermediate color. Where do we apply it? Well, in QGIS, everywhere you see this button, this is the data defined override. You can override that static value with an expression, and it'll be replaced by that. So we say instead of this pink color for every line, compute a new color for that line based on its elevation. So we write an expression there, and our color changes. We have different colors for each line now. It's pretty cool. We can do this manually, but this gives us more control of how we want to do it. Uh, again, I, I want very less blue. You can see, this, because it's a linear transition, we have equal amount of blue and green. I want blue to be less at the lower elevation. I want more range for the higher colors. So we can, there are other scaling functions. There is a scale polynomial, there's scale exponential. You can apply different scaling functions. So we can replace our scale linear with the scale polynomial and say, I want it to be you know, a non-linear uh, translation. And now we have this nice visualization where we have less of blue and more range for the higher range. And again, this gives us a lot more control. So if you're trying to do some visualization, if you want more control, you can use expressions instead of the built-in classification uh, tools that you want. OK, last one. This is a fun one. Making QGIS icons follow you around in QGIS. How can we do this? Uh, we're going to make QGIS icons rotate wherever your cursor position is. And again, you can set up an expression so that as you move your mouse around, the QGIS icons will follow you around to point to you. Uh, this was inspired by Keith Jenkins. I saw his post a few years back on his Twitter feed and said, someday I'll figure this out. And finally, for this talk, I uh, uh, wrote a tutorial for this. So let's see how we can do this. First, we start with a grid of points. We just created a grid of points, set the icon to be the QGIS marker. Uh, your QGIS comes with a bunch of logos that you can use. I use them in all my maps, but you can say for each point, just put the QGIS logo. So we have a grid of icons. Right now, they're all static icons. When we say we have this QGIS icon and our cursor is here, you can see the point of the icon is facing this, so we want the icon to be there. And if you measure it, I did, the azimuth of this is 135 degrees. So the, the point icon is 135 degrees from north. So we compute the azimuth of the point to the current cursor position. And if it's 135, it says zero rotation. That's the default. So when you have zero location, zero rotation, as you move your cursor around and the azimuth changes, you rotate it by whatever the azimuth is, minus 135. And that will make the icon always point towards where your cursor is. And you keep going, and you say, always point, rotate the icon so that the pointer in the queue is pointing your cursor. How do we do this? Well, we have the azimuth function. This takes two points and gives you the azimuth of that. What are the two points we want? There is this variable called canvas cursor point, which has the position of your cursor on the canvas. It's called the lat long of your cursor position. 
So we can use this and say, compute the azimuth between the point and the current cursor position. And this will give you the azimuth and convert to degrees and uh, make it minus 35. Where do we set this? Well, again, for the icon, we have a rotation parameter. We said don't use a static rotation, use an expression instead. And now we have this expression and our QGIS icons will rotate based on the current cursor position. It doesn't yet work perfectly because as you move the cursor around, the map doesn't update because the map has no reason to update. QGIS canvas is designed to update only when you move something or zoom around and then only to refresh. So we go to the layer settings and there's a rendering option which says, refresh this layer at certain interval regardless of whether something happened or not. So we set this interval to be like 100 milliseconds. And now when we move our cursor, the QGIS icons follow us around. This is really cool to see. You know, try this out, it's a 10 minute exercise and you'll see like, you know, just really fun thing to see this happen. Also a bit spooky <laughs> if you want to try this. And this is something fun and interesting, but what do we use it for? Well, it opens up a whole lot of possibilities. Like many of you may not even realize that you have access to the canvas as a variable. So you can control the canvas through your expression. You can maybe zoom certain area or change the color of some feature as you hover over it. Like if you want to set up a maps, now you can use something like that. Uh, there was a recent example of somebody trying something cool, and I want to share this with you. You can create maps like this. These are the reveal maps. You have two layers. As you move your cursor around, it reveals what's underneath the current layer. And this is again done with the same canvas cursor position and the, uh, uh, the layer rendering modes uh, where you can say, wherever my cursor is, mask that region. And it shows what's underneath. All right, so this is another application. I just wrote this yesterday. So it's fresh for the, the conference audience. If you want to try out this tutorial, you can try it and see how to set up something like this. So again, it opens up a whole lot of possibilities of what you can do with the expressions. If you, my goal for this talk was to tell you what are the possibilities and open your mind to what you can do with expressions. Uh, if you are inspired and if you want to explore more expressions, I have a whole lot of materials. Everything I showed here is in this link. We have a whole series of tutorials on expressions on QGISTutorials.com. Step by step, you can replicate it and learn. Uh, I have a course module where I teach about those advanced expressions. And I've been working with expressions for a long time for different kind of analysis. And I have those blog posts. If you're curious, including how to create this really nice river map, if you're curious, get access to this uh, presentation, it's uh, bit.ly slash QGIS desk expression, and then you'll be able to uh, work with expressions. So I hope you build something cool, and thank you for your time. Thank you for the presentation. It was really cool. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of questions. I think we have time for maybe three of them. So are there any questions? <laughs> Does anyone have, have any question? Uh, just on the side note, uh, you can actually like create those expressions even uh, using Python uh, as part of your plugins. You can actually set up. There is a whole infrastructure in the QGIS prepared, so you can you can actually prepare your own expression and then use it as a function within other functions. Yeah, we, we, in Lutra, we use it uh, for some styling in some plugins and stuff, and it brings you yet to another level of what you can actually do. Yeah, so if you have, find that, I wish I had a function in the expression engine that doesn't exist yet, you can write one using Python, and you can use it. Are there yeah, so the question is how do we publish that, maybe to the web or somewhere else? Uh, I don't know yet if the, the QGIS server and the QGIS web client supports this kind of live expressions. Uh, it's QGIS expressions, so I feel if they are supported in the web clients, it should be easy to add that because they, they have that. I don't think it exists yet, but it'll be nice to have that in the web client so that you, know, you can publish this project and have that kind of interactive stuff uh, with that. Uh, but actually, you can, you can distribute them as a... Uh, as a project, right? Yeah. 
And one of the cool things about expressions is that uh, in an organization, if you use expression instead of like custom Python code, it can replace like hundreds of lines of Python code as an expression, and they go with the project. You don't have to distribute them as separate Python files, teach people how to use it, just save them in the project, and as the, whoever uses the project, they have the expression. So it just makes the distribution and maintenance quite easy. I always say that expressions are a great bridge for like GIS analysts uh, to move to programming, because it's kind of programming, but it's not really programming. It's much more approachable. They can also maintain stuff much better. I worked with a client who was just a bunch of GIS analysts, and they say, can you solve this problem? And I could solve this using Python, but then would they be able to maintain it if something changes? How do they run the Python code? I built the whole thing using expressions, and five years later, they're still using it. Because when something changes, they, they know how to edit the expressions, and they can use it. So again, it helps people maintain this better, and also help people learn programming. You can learn a lot of the programming construct about for loops and if using this, which is much more visual and easy environment, and then move to Python when you really need to. Yeah. Yeah, the question is when do we stop with expressions? Like expressions are very tempting. I discovered aggregate expressions a few years back and I could solve all my spatial analysis problems using aggregate expressions. And then like I'm going to solve everything using this. But at some point, you need to stop because one, expressions do not use spatial index yet. So your expressions, if you have large data set, they do not use that. So if there's an equivalent tool in the processing toolbox, use that. That'll go much faster than doing the same thing with expressions. I also suggest that if you're doing some geometry generators and if you find it slow, use the processing tool called uh, geometry by expression. You run the tool, put the same expression there, it'll run the tool and it'll create a new layer with that expression as the output. So then you have a static layer that has been generated from that expression, which was slow. It might take five minutes to run it, but then you have a static layer that you can use that. Yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot.